It's time for Global Insight. Calling for an end to testing nuclear weapons, 186 countries signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1996, recognising that a nuclear arms race cannot be won by anyone. In the twi uh, 25 years since it was agreed on, all but 10 nations have ratified it, with fewer than a dozen nuclear tests conducted since then. August 29th marks the day to highlight those efforts to continue towards the goal of ending nuclear tests. And UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stressed that effective arms control and disarmament has never been more important, especially at a time when geopolitical tensions and rivalry are intensifying. He said that humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. Annihilation. However, with nearly 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world today, countries have been looking to update, not scrap their arsenals. Today we discuss the status of nuclear weapons and how to promote the safe use of nuclear energy for civilian, not military purposes. For this we invite Dr. Nikolai Sokov, Senior Fellow at the Vienna Centre for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation and EUHO, Associate Professor of Nuclear Engineering at Seoul National University. Very warm welcome to you both, and it's a very early morning for you, Dr. Sokov. Um, let's start with you. The uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it lays the foundation for international efforts to regulate nuclear weapons. Um, it prevents more states from acquiring them, and uh, it advances disarmament. But research by the uh, Stockholm International Peace Institute, it says that global nuclear arsenals are expected to grow as uh, states are continuing to modernize. So is it really realistic at this point to expect nuclear states to reduce their spot stockpile um, amid all this global conflict that we're seeing? And in that regard, do you think nuclear deterrence really does work? Right. Uh, well, no, arsenals do not actually grow except apparently in China. It's at least uh, uh, some data shows that China might be expanding its nuclear arsenal. Uh, other nuclear states improve the quality and the capabilities um, of their weapon systems. Uh, but of course, uh, at the present moment, it's very hard to expect uh, uh, U reductions. Uh, looks like uh, uh, the capability of to reduce nuclear weapons is really bottomed out, and we cannot move any further down unless the international situation stabilizes. And uh, um, many states, is first of all, is actually Russia, uh, to some extent also China. Uh, consider nuclear weapons as a guarantee um, of their security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the United States and their allies that are conventionally more powerful, uh, um, more powerful um, in, uh, in conventional weapons. Uh, so yes, we have really uh, struck the deadlock uh, in nuclear arms reduction uh, for well, quite some time, I'm afraid, for a number of years. Um, Professor Lee, of course, the uh, UN uh, Secretary General, he talked about possible miscalculations that could lead to accidents or even conflict. But of course, there have been times where accidents almost occurred at nuclear weapons facilities or simply while moving them, so logistically as well. So, Professor Lee, um, there are now many questions around the safety of the nuclear plant in Ukraine, of course, amid the ongoing fighting. So how do you assess the situation? Uh, so nuclear uh, power plants require a constant supply of electricity for their routine operations and to power the safety systems in case of an emergency or accident. So they also need electricity to cool down, um, cool shut down reactors, which consistently produce heat. Uh, last week, uh, two units of Ukraine's uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant were temporarily disconnected to the grid line due to the fire resulted by shelling. And during the disconnection, its cooling system was backed up by the diesel, I mean, emergency diesel generators. And it was a crucial event in nuclear safety. A day after the disconnection occurred, uh, the Zaporizhia's nuclear power plant's connection to the grid was restored with all measurements of radioactivity within normal range. However, um, since there has been some continued shelling on the reactor site, and Ukraine um, did not have complete information on the nature of the damage, IAEA is urgently uh, 
preparing to dispatch experts to inspect the damage. So the power costs have highlighted uh, the potential vulnerability of a nuclear power plant located in the middle of an act, middle of an active conflict zone like war. And Dr. Sokov, uh, how do you see the situation in Ukraine being resolved with uh, concerns of a nuclear accident or nuclear uh, well, calamity really happening around the plant? Um, well, it's very hard to resolve it, uh, well, at least in the very short term, because war continues. And uh, no matter how many calls international community makes, uh, say, uh, uh, toward Russia, um, uh, you cannot really expect the war stopping. I do hope that the visit uh, of a team uh, by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, that's hopefully uh, taking place next week uh, uh, will help uh, to stabilize the situation uh, at and around uh, the nuclear power plant. Okay. Yes, I agree that it's a very dangerous and quite unstable situation there. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Sokov, well, um, the, uh, well, during the Cold War, the US and Russia, they were able to strike up the 1987 um, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and they were able to start reducing their nuclear uh, weapons stockpile. Uh, do you see this kind of uh, compromise or this kind of um, ad uh, advancement in efforts to uh, control arms uh, proliferation in this situation um, amid all this uh, tension that we're seeing between the United States and Russia, uh, China, and also with Iran posing a nuclear uh, weapons threat as well. Uh, uh, well, in dangerous times uh, uh, that we see today, uh, the need in arms control is probably the greatest. Uh, we do need to prevent war, we do need to prevent escalation, and so on and so forth. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the prospects of arms control right now are quite actually low. Uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, to expect uh, of the United States and Russia uh, to resume negotiations, it, although both sides actually say that they want to do that, uh, but in reality, uh, that's actually really uh, a very low chance. Uh, uh, the vast majority of treaties that were concluded uh, in the past uh, um, more than three decades are no longer in force. Well, in fact, uh, only one arms control treaty right now um, uh, in force, and that's the bilateral uh, U.S.-Russian uh, New START treaty uh, that reduced strategic weapons. Uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is not yet in force. And there is really no chance that it will be enforced, although uh, the verification system under that treaty uh, continues to operate. So we live in a very, very unstable uh, time uh, because uh, it's at the time uh, when the threat of conflict, including nuclear conflict, is greatest. Uh, we do not have the tools uh, of to mitigate these dangers. And Professor Lee, while well, Europe's uh, going through an energy crunch right now um, due to the Ukraine war, and Germany and also Japan, they are considering building new nuclear reactors. Uh, will a transition to nuclear energy be feasible in such a short amount of time, and is it going to be safe? Uh, so as long as the supply chain of nuclear power, power plant construction is presented within a country, those countries can start to increase nuclear portion um, in a timely manner. However, uh, in the case of Germany, due to its nuclear phase-out policy, the supply chain may have been destroyed significantly. As a result, it may have to rely on foreign countries such as France to effectively restore nuclear energy supply. For Japan, uh, the economic competitiveness um, of nuclear power plant and public acceptance will be a key factors for effective restoration. And Dr. Sokov, how do you see this? So Germany and Japan drawing up plans to build new nuclear reactors amid the global energy crisis. What do you make of this trend? Do you think it might possibly uh, increase geopolitical risks and security concerns? 
uh, uh, I would say not necessarily. Nuclear power plants in and of themselves uh, do not present um, uh, a serious threat to international security, of course, as long as countries uh, that operate these plants uh, exercise uh, the necessary level of safety and security measures. Uh, the problem, of course, uh, uh, that's why serious is the one that we see in Ukraine, where uh, mm, the actual war is being conducted mm, around in that territory of the nuclear power plant. And Professor Lee, well, uh, countries around the world are emphasizing the uh, safe civilian use of nuclear energy but how do you draw the line between developing nuclear fuel for civilian and military purposes and why does the 20 percent uranium enrichment line really matter moreover how is it monitored okay so um any enrichment less than 20 percent is referred to as low enrichment meaning that it has no or very limited relevance to nuclear weapon production Hence, the civilian reactors are running on enrichment less than 20 percent. Uh, to be more precise, almost all civilian reactors, such as light water reactors, are operating on enrichment less than 5 percent. So by all means, uh, compliance with low enrichment uranium usage for civilian purpose is strictly monitored and ensured by IAEA today. And Dr. Sokov, well, one of the uh, countries that were highlighted during the NPT review conference last week was North Korea. And of course, um, here on the South Korean Peninsula, on the Korean Peninsula, that is the biggest security risk. Uh, we're hearing reports of an imminent seventh nuclear test being conducted in North Korea. So how do you assess North Korea's level of nuclear weapons capability? And what will you be watching for upon its seventh nuclear test when it happens? Uh, well, the nuclear weapons capability of North Korea, uh, which is not very large, especially when you compare it uh, to key countries such as the United States um, and Russia, uh, but any amount of nuclear weapons is extremely dangerous. Well, especially uh, with the small kind of territory of, like the Korean Peninsula. Uh, yes, I would be actually watching uh, the continuing probably uh, modernization of the enhanced quality and the enhanced capability of nuclear weapons. Uh, but even more, I've been watching the capability of North Korea to deliver nuclear weapons. Uh, that's rapidly becoming almost global, at least. It's almost the entire northern hemisphere will soon uh, will be within North Korea's actual reach. Uh, uh, yes, and of course, uh, uh, that does change uh, the international security environment quite considerably. Modernization has been very, very steady. Uh, it's, well, and in fact, quite rapid, much more rapid than mm, in any other country uh, in the world. And Dr. Sokov, well, where do you see the next nuclear conflict really breaking out, whether through, it's through a political decision or simply by an accident? And how can it be prevented? I don't think we're talking about an accident. I think we're talking about escalation uh, of, of a relatively limited conflict, uh, a conventional conflict, such as, for example, the ongoing war in Ukraine could escalate uh, to draw in uh, one or two uh, uh, members of NATO uh, and against Russia directly. Uh, yes, and that might actually uh, lead to conventional conflict uh, between NATO and Russia. Uh, yes, and in such a conflict, it's actually likely uh, uh, that Russia might eventually uh, use nuclear weapons and so, so forth. So I do not expect one um, a large scale uh, surprise nuclear strike uh, like the ones uh, we used to fear uh, during the Cold War. Yes, and two, yes, I do not expect. Um, on a carefully planned, uh, even limited use of nuclear weapons, uh, but I'm very afraid of escalation uh, where the logical events uh, uh, 
or slowly, maybe within several kind of weeks, uh, even months, uh, can lead uh, uh, to the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, how can we prevent that? Well, it's actually very, very difficult. Uh, because really you need uh, to address the root causes um, of the current international crisis, even that's not easy. Uh, uh, so it's unfortunately, we cannot even talk about the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's a very slow kind of process. Uh, well, it's very important uh, that countries continue to talk to each other. Uh, it's important that all countries are afraid, in fact, of using nuclear weapons, so they need to coordinate, they need to be in contact all the time uh, uh, to avoid the steps that might lead the other side uh, to use nuclear weapons. Uh, so dialogue, contact, and really being sensitive uh, to the red lines of all sides. Looks like communication definitely is key to that. And the MPT, of course, it's the only binding, binding uh, multilateral commitment to disarmament by the nuclear weapons states. And Professor Lee, well, they review this from time to time, the NPT. And at the review conference last week, countries agreed on pursuing new capable, uh, capacity building projects under the uh, foundational infrastructure for the uh, responsible use of small modular reactor technology programs. So why is this program important? And uh, as it's Monday to end on an encouraging note, how do you see South Korea's potential of developing and exporting such small modular reactors? Uh, the program will foster to solve a key issue in deploying SMRs. A key technological issue of SMR deployment is how cost effectively one can build it. And in Western world, uh, Korea is the leading manufacturer of key nuclear components with unparalleled supply chains being vitalized under this government. Korea has a good chance of de developing, building, and even exporting the, the world's most economic SMR, I think. And well, this is where we must leave the interview today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nikolai Sokov, Senior Fellow at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, and uh, Dr. Eur, Associate Professor of Nuclear Engineering at Seoul National University. Thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.